Hey, Gestalt Education Nation, uh, new sponsor alert, new sponsor alert. Today, we're excited to announce uh, Dynamic Disc Designs and Jerome Fryer. Uh, we have an awesome discount code for you. Just use the code Gestalt uh, to get a little bit of money off on the, the Dynamic Disc Designs. They're the, the most realistic anatomical disc that we've ever seen. If you caught our, our episode with uh, Dr. Stuart McGill, you saw an entire shelf full of them. Everything from cavitation instruction to uh, dy- uh, disc dysfunction to SI joint dysfunction, all sorts of amazing joint stuff. Joint movement, yes. vertebral movement. Absolutely. So uh, go to Dynamic Disc Designs, uh, use the code Gestalt. As always, you can use the code Gestalt on Core 360 belt to get a, a little discount on the belts there. We love to use that for biofeedback for teaching respiration, intra-abdominal pressure, and how the, the abdominal wall should be working in, during function. Uh, and then the last one, use the code Gestalt Education 10. Those will all be in the description in the podcast. Gestalt Education 10 at humanlocomotion.com uh, to get off uh, some money off of all of his awesome gadgets and tools and uh, rehab uh, materials. What's your favorite, Brett? He's got a trunk full, but I think, you know, integrating the Topro in, I think, has been a game changer for us here at the office. So I think that would be my pick. Beautiful. All right, guys, don't forget, use the code Gestalt, Gestalt Education 10. Uh, visit the show notes and you'll be uh, hooked up. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Today, we are uh, back for our second appearance of our, our guest today uh, with Dr. Antonio Stecco. The last time uh, we did this, we were in Phoenix. It was a little bit warmer where we were last time. So. It was. <laughs> it's like to, 20 degrees here now. 20 degrees and snowing here in Troy. So, uh, what, yeah, what a mess. But uh, we're thankful that you're here in Troy uh, for the Fast Manipulation Level 1 course, uh, the hybrid course, which is a, it's always a hit. It's, uh, it's a weekend full of hands-on, which is so awesome. Awesome. It's uh, the whole weekend is basically hands on. Brett, you were the patient. Yeah. You, you said you're almost a little bit sore today. You, they were working on all your dysfunctions. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful. I love it. Amazing. So, yeah. So uh, today, our second appearance, we're, we'll do this a little bit shorter version because we have one big topic that we want to talk about today. And uh, the reason for it is not hidden that we have a huge Congress coming up in uh, the first weekend of November at Parker University, which is the Neurodynamics World Summit. So this is the first ever. Uh, this literally started kind of on a whim. And, uh, we were sitting down with Michael. Uh, uh, last at the beginning of the year when we were in uh, Phoenix for a week with him and then in Jupiter for a week with him. And uh, we started talking about how DNS and neurodynamics can work together, number one. And then we started talking about how neurodynamics is also uh, a, a player with all these other things, such as fascial manipulation can affect the peripheral nerves, uh, ART, uh, even the nervous system uh, pain in general, pain classification systems, uh, uh, inflammatory processes in the in the body can affect the, the nerves. And so uh, we kind of stowed up this this, this whole Congress that's going to include Antonio, it's going to include you talking about the DNS section, uh, Michael Leahy talking about the ART, we're going to have Annie O'Connor talking about pain classification and, and kind of how to bring it all together. Uh, Dave Seaman's going to talk about nutrition and how we can support our patients with uh, with nutrition. Uh, what else am I forgetting? Jeffrey Bove. Jeffrey Bove is going to literally kind of lay out the, the foundation. All the research on nerve exactly. function and dysfunction. So, uh, and that, that's going to be at Park University. It's going to be huge. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I, I'm so Did you excited. Say here or not? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Put the mic up to your mouth if you didn't mind. Thanks. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, that we want to kind of hear uh, Antonio's take on on how the fascial system can affect peripheral nerves. Number one, and and uh, what your approach is to treating that, or, or even assessing uh, kind of the, the fascial system's involvement with those types of things. Well, I mean, nerve is really related to fascia. In which way? Because nerve has to go to a specific location in order to reach the bone and reach the, the muscle, reach the skin and so on. So the nerve uh, is, you know, surrounded by the, the epinephrine, what we call. So this is like a fascia tissue that in some place is connected with intermuscular septa. So, of course, the nerve stay like it have like his uh, vital space only because it is able to be independent by the surrounding region at the same time be able to glide and be you know isolated by the friction of the muscle and by you know the movement of the surrounding area but this means that that his like a function is strictly related with the fascia because of course if the fascia is rigid the fascia can generate even compression of the nerve so this is why we have to think about that the nerve can be entrapped at least in three four area so first of all when it go outside of you know at the level like uh, intermuscular septa, you know, the nerve can travel inside intermuscular septa. And the quality of the tension of the intermuscular septa has to be preserved. Then uh, at that level, let's say that we have uh, motor fiber, sensory fiber, autonomic fiber. 
Then suddenly the nerve will go through an intermuscular septa to move from area to area. And when it goes through an intermuscular septa, that is very critical because there is a hole in the intermuscular septa. And that hole becomes critical. And if you have an entropy at that level, you can have a weakness, autonomic problem, a sensory problem. So this can be a major problem that you can detect even with the EMG. Then the nerve will go through the deep fascia with the sensory autonomic fiber in order to reach eventually the skin. So when the nerve goes through the deep fascia, the deep fascia can entrap the nerve. And so you have problem with sensory and autonomic part. And then lastly, the nerve will travel for a while inside the superficial fascia before to, to reach the skin. Why is that? Because the nerve doesn't go perpendicular immediately to the skin. Because in that way, if you glide, you generate a sliding of the skin, you will break the nerve. So you go up like a stirs, traveling the muscular septa, traveling in the superficial fascia, and then reaching the, the, the skin. This is why we have to always take in consideration that the nerve can be entrapped in the periphery. Oh, I always say you can never exclude that the subject have a peripheral nerve entrapment. It's so common, and there is so many variables, and so many possibilities that uh, you can never exclude. Even because uh, there's a simple concept that has to be remembered. 80% of the fiber of the normal peripheral nerve, like a medial nerve, are autonomic. So this means that uh, when you have a nerve compression, it would be easier that you have a more autonomic compression rather than sensory motor, okay? And if it's superficial, it would be sensory or autonomic. So the patient can, be, can have like a vasoconstriction, can have a deficit of pillar action, can be, you know, have a, like hypersuduration or lack of sudoration. And the patient is not even aware, but then trauma is there. Mm. Then is enough something to trigger a little bit more entrapment or something else, and then you start to have a complex regional pain syndrome. So we published an article about that, and we saw and we proved with different case that the complex regional pain syndrome is a double crash syndrome. So it's a du double or triple nerve entrapment. Mm -hmm. The patient was not aware because it was just autonomic symptom, that it was minor, the patient doesn't bother on so much. But then the second entrapment or the third entrapment come in, and then you have uh, this, uh, you know, massive, you know, and a giant manifestation that uh, is not, you know, re self-resolving because the periphery is not communicated with the central part. Mm -hmm. So the minor trauma, you know, may, minor ankle sprain, you know, minor, you know, uh, surgery, whatever it is, generate this uh, massive uh, reaction, and uh, again you have to restore the communication between proximal and periphery. So this is like a, it's multiple concepts that has to be digested properly by on, on every clinician. And that, this is a level one fascial manipula ma manipulation course we've done. Would you do anything different in a, if you knew something was a peripheral nerve entrapment than what, you're, what everyone's learning this weekend, or does it not change anything? No, it will change. It will change a lot uh, for two simple reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, is it true that uh, all the sensory nerve, uh, they have a hole in the deep fascia to reach the skin? Okay, so 100% of your sensory nerve, they have to go through the deep fascia. So this is clear, <clears throat> everybody know this, okay? Then sometimes they forget during the clinical evaluation. <laughs> all right, but rather than that, the good news is that you don't have to reach the hole where the nerve is in trap, because the hole, uh, if the deep fascia, like fascia lattice, is a long socks, if you pull the socks, of course it will pinch the nerve because uh, the, the hole will become less adaptable. Lucky for you, you don't have to work over there. That it will be unlikely to get to that, that area. It will be unpleasure for the patient to get there because the patient will have electric shock immediately. Lucky for you, you can treat the surrounding area. So if you know the location of the major lack of gliding of the fascia, so our central coordination, you treat that, that are nearby, but are in a safe area. So you know that whenever you treat that area, they will not start electric shock, it will not bruise the nerve. But you will decrease, uh, increase the adaptability of the fascia, so even the hole on site will be more adaptable. Mm -hmm. So this is a good news. The bad news is that uh, all these nerves have a huge anatomical variation, okay? So in any case, you will never know where is the, exactly the hole of that nerve. But lucky for you, you don't really care when, where it is. 
On the other side, uh, the nerve uh, are smart. The nerve are localized in area where there is uh, less mechanics to be preserved. So they don't travel in a region where there is a lot of motion because they will suffer of mechanical stress. So the nerve travel in area where we have more, we call a center of fusion. Center where there is a fusion of motion, but less dramatic, less, ma less massive motion like uh, over the center of coordination. So the nerve travel in that area, okay? So in intermuscular septa where you don't have like a clear motion in the three-dimensional plane of the space, but where you generate motion in more sophisticated, more complex motion, okay? So the nerve is more protected by friction of the muscle. It, in that area, so you don't find out what we call central coordination, so the point that you start in level one, but you will find out the point that we start in level two, central fusion, mm -hmm. okay? That are, by the way, over the retinacula. So think about the retinacula of the ankle. The superficial peroneal nerve go exactly through that retinacula. So if you have a rigidity of the retinacula, you will have a numbness. Think about every time that you have like an ankle sprain. Patient come in your office with pain in the ankle. But then if you investigate, they will tell you, look, I have numbness in the foot. I say, well, forget about that. Let's think about the ankle pain. In reality, there are two manifestations of the same problem. Ankle sprain, fascia become rigid, painful, myofascial pain, plus nerve entrapment. So without no or with consciousness, you always treat uh, two problems at the same time because there is always the myofascial problem with the mechanical part uh, plus a nerve entrapment. And uh, nerve entrapment can be the priority, sometimes nerve entrapment can be the minor part. Well, we're so used to thinking too about nerve entrapment getting hung up in muscles, like maybe the pronator teres or maybe our hamstring, whatever the example might be. So are you proposing that maybe it's less entrapment within the muscle and maybe more in fascia or we just don't know or it doesn't matter? What would you say? We published a couple of years ago a review of literature about uh, nerve entrapment. And there is way more literature about fascia rather than muscle because it's still muscle. But muscle is a minor percentage of the area. Okay, so again, muscle can entrap a major nerve for sure, where you have also motor component, okay? So of course, piriform syndrome and so on, it can be a massive manifestation of the symptom because you have motor component. But that's the minority, okay? 100% of the nerve have to go through different hole of the deep fascia. So it will be more likely that you have a fascia entrapment rather than the few cases of muscle entrapment. Mm -hmm. The few cases of muscle entrapment are easy diagnosis. Everybody can make a diagnosis right away, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Make a diagnosis of nerve entrapment will be much more challenging. At some time, uh, the nerve entrapment can mimate other symptom. So tarsal tunnel, at the end of the day, is a fascia entrapment. It can mimate a mortal neuroma. So people get crazy to find out the neuroma between the metatarsal and in reality is a, a tarsal tunnel syndrome that you can treat uh, easily manually without uh, you know generating you know any surgery over there. Even because uh, if you talk with a lot of surgeons, they start to step back for that surgery because when you do that surgery, you try to open up the hole. Now, you don't know what happened later on, or you will know soon, because uh, whenever you cut the fascia, okay, fibrosis will kick in. And the fibrosis can make it even worse. So, I mean, it's not always, but I have cases of a neuroma of the superficial peroneal nerve after surgery. So before there was just pain, then the patient was not even to walk because every time they put load over there, the fascia is so rigid it will pull in the nerve and generate like a shooting pain at the patient. Now the patient is in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. So this is an example how a lot of, of uh, surgeons, I, I have experience even in the uh, UK, they step back to do typical release of the nerve mm -hmm. because unfortunately you have to generate a huge, you know, you know, degeneration, like a huge hole uh, to make sure that that will not generate a future entrapment. Mm -hmm. So manually seems really the way to go to treat this kind of disorder. 
Beautiful. So, I, I mean, if you had Morton's to Roma and a patient, are you, do you have some things that you're specifically going to be looking for? Are you just going to work up each individual patient individually and you're going to work on whatever you potentially find with them? Or, or how do you work up a patient with Morton's to Roma? All right. So, again, if there's a, a neuroma, this is alteration of the anatomy. So, there's not much you can do. Okay. But if the neuroma, they saw the neuroma a little bit with ultrasound, but they didn't see very well with the MRI, is a minor one. So if you treat, if you decrease the tension right there, if you allow the metatarsal to be more adaptable, if you decrease the tension of the nerve by itself, because with one twin trap, the nerve is less adaptable, the patient will be pain-free, okay? If, unfortunately, like it happened a lot of time, it's too late, there is a real neuroma that is, you know, visualize clearly with MRI that is too late. Uh, you can try, but the result will be not exciting so much. Okay, so that is a little bit too late and surgery probably is not required. Mm -hmm. But there is a uh, plenty of time uh, before to get to a major neuroma. Neuroma is uh, a reaction of the epinevrium that try to make space to the nerve. But this reaction will generate an ab extrinsic compression because the metatarsal is not adaptable, okay? So it is a strategy of the body to make space to the nerve, but at the end, the, the surrounding area is so rigid that it will even collapse even more the nerve, okay? So that is a clear sign. It doesn't happen without reason. It's a clear sign that that foot is rigid, and so, I mean, there will be plenty of time before to take care of that symptom. Sure. It doesn't happen overnight. Right, right. Yeah. What about uh, uh, in that same uh, sense, like if you have more of an inflammatory component like that, are you using tools in your practice to help deal with those uh, inflammatory processes or to help calm the nerve down? Or like where, where are you at with uh, passive modalities or anything like that to help with it? Or are you just letting that rest and kind of letting the course take its course? Uh, first of all, are we really sure there's an inflammatory process? Okay. Because uh, you see the actual literature is really go against the the theory that was in the past that there is there is inflammation whatever or inflammation has to be clearly visualized <clears throat> inflammation there is specific process to find out so if there is inflammation around the epinevrium okay you clearly see with uh, your ultrasound that there is let's say middle nerve okay carpal tunnel syndrome what do you do with ultrasound, you go right proximal to the middle nerve. You check the two axes of the nerve. You see that below the carpal ligament, the nerve is squeezed, so the two axes are not symmetrical. Above the carpal ligament is more symmetrical, or it can be even swelling around. Okay, that is a clear sign of, of inflammation. But you make a clear diagnosis. It's fast and simple. Okay, mm -hmm. what you can do? The inflammation will go away by itself. Because if you decrease the tension of the carpal ligament or also of, of the other neighbor entrapment, you, the body will heal by itself, okay? Because inflammation, as the body generates, if there is no rheumatological project, process or other, it will heal by itself. But let's go back with the medial carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? So we saw in literature and we saw in clinical practice that... Uh, if you have like 80% of the entrapment below the carpal ligament, you would have to have surgery, no way. But if you have 50% of the entrapment below the carpal ligament and 25, 25 on the way of the nerve, surgery or fascia manipulation is the same. If you have 20, 30 below the carpal ligament in you know, 40 plus 40 or like uh, there remain on the way, you do surgery, and the patient doesn't get better. As you know, like f around 15% of total carp carpal tunnel syndrome release doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't work? Because that was not the major entrapment. Okay? So this is an important principle because uh, people, you know, focus the attention in the few area that, lead, that, you know, usually are the common region of entrapment. And they forget to think about all the other. But these stuff are changing because even here in US, a lot of people now are making diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, not with EMG, that is not specific. Because EMG tells you that from the hand, from the 
elbow to the hand, there is a decrease of velocity. But this doesn't tell you that the, the decrease of velocity is due to the carpal ligament. Right, exactly. And all over this area can be entrapped. And there is a plenty of literature that explain that uh, pronatal steris, you know, in, in antibacterial fascia and uh, biceps aponeurosis can entrap the nerve. Mm -hmm. So this is, has to explain very well that uh, EMG doesn't tell you that uh, surgery is the only option. A ultrasound can tell you where is the entrapment because if you go up with the ultrasound, if you do a simple test, you put the ultrasound in the middle of the arm, you do extension and flexion of the wrist, mm -hmm. you can see the middle nerve that should bend, should bend laterally one centimeter, okay, a, a, a third of an inch, okay. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, it means there is an entrapment more proximal to the wrist, okay. As well, you have to see a nice gliding craniocaudal. Okay, so this is a technique that are now using more and more people, and they are more specific and sensitive than EMG, because EMG it can be the very you know accurate EMG, very sophisticated EMG, always tell you there is a decrease of velocity, but again doesn't tell you where. Mm -hmm. Ultrasound can tell you where. A ultrasound will push you to tell you like that you have to do manual therapy and not surgery in that case. How certain are you in your assessment and fascial manipulation of where the entrapment site is? All right, so we have another good news. Okay, so you, there are always like a possible region of entrapment. The entrapment it can be released on the side where there's an entrapment, but also on the opposite side because the intramuscular septa go all through. Okay. So if the entrapment is this side, but you decrease the tension from the other one, maybe you don't give the 100% of the result, but 80%. The nerve doesn't care. The nerve, when you give like a 20, 40% of the result, the quality of life will go back as before, okay? Even if you leave a little bit of alteration. So follow our guideline. We allow you to find out the areas that are more densified from uh, you know, our, our you know, background, the biomechanical model. You decrease the tension, you maybe don't restore 100% the entrapment, but the patient will be fine. You, you need the major entrapment to have symptom, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you leave some entrapment on and off, uh, that's not a problem. And so for the guideline, you can really detect uh, the major area of the alteration and get uh, the result that the patient will expect. In a case like that, then are you still relying on, I know one of the principles you teach that you would, you're, you're going to uh, prioritize what you feel is the, the most restricted or the most uh, adhesed, densified. In a case like that, then are you more searching for uh, a presentation of symptoms, meaning you're reproducing symptoms, or are you still relying on what you're feeling? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, palpation in this case, instead to recreate this, uh, the radiation pain that maybe is due to the fascia, like a really pulling mm -hmm. tension, it will regenerate the numbness. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, the, the good news is that uh, you recreate the numbness, but you are not over the nerve. Mm -hmm. So you create the numbness because you are nearby in areas that are safer, that are mapped and codified. So you push there. The, 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 the friction over there will irritate the nerve nearby. And so, you know, that, that area is generated and trauma. So the reproduction of the symptom during the palpatory verification is the way to define how far you can go with the treatment with the result. Beautiful. What about, um, can we maybe go into, we, we talked about peripheral nerves pretty well. What about uh, more central nerves? So nerve roots or even more closer to the spine. Uh, what's fascia manipulations take on radiculopathies or anything along those lines? Uh, do we have an answer for an acute radiculopathy in the fascial manipulation model? Or like um, we have a disc, like an overt disc herniation. All right. What's your... All right. So disc herniation, the manifestation is quite clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I... Always, we, we start to see a lot of that because surgery now, they, they step back before to do surgery this patient. So let's say that typical disc herniation for lower limbs, that's more clear. So we have a, a pain, constant pain that from the glutes, not from the low back area. Mm -hmm. From the glutes or lower than that, uh, it will be presented, okay? It can be just the calf. So constant pain, uh, it doesn't change as much with the motion uh, until you don't do like full range of motion, okay? 
So, but it's a constant pain. So motion is constant. So that is a clear sign that there's a radiculopathy, okay? So sitting, standing, walking, whatever it is, the pain is always there, okay? End of range will generate the, sh the shooting pain. Middle range will not change as much. Vice versa, typical sciatic, like a pain due to the fascial problem, like a sciatic type pain, the pain can start easily from the low back area going down to the leg, it will be extremely sensitive motion. So a few degree, it can be shooting pain, okay? Some position will be impossible to maintain. Some position will generate a little bit of relief of the pain, okay? That is typical myofascial pain. That is way more common than radiculopathy. Radiculopathy doesn't occur overnight. Sciatica pain due to myofascial pain occur overnight, okay? So this is the minimal you know, different diagnosis that you have to do before to start with the process, okay? So let's say that we have a really radiculopathy. So the patient have a gluteus pain that go down to the leg, okay? What you can do? The only stuff that you can do is, first of all, to check it out if the entrapment is not just at the root level, but also down the way. Because never, nobody take in consideration the case that if the, the nerve is not extensible, it's a cord. So if you do a dissection, you, you take a, in the hand a nerve, it's not extensible. So why the nerve should not suffer if it's pinched at the end? It will suffer in the same way as is it, the pinch in front, in, uh, at the proximal region. So first of all, you have to make sure that uh, on the way, the nerve is not pinched, okay? Because if you pinch the nerve at the ankle, if you, bend, if you do a zag, uh, the patient have the same symptom as if there was pinch at the level of the root, okay? So that is something that you can do easily, a USS over there. If it's really the disc that can be, the only stuff that you can do is, first of all, the disc doesn't herniate without reason, okay? So you have to assess all the segment lumbi and pelvis to try to decrease the tension over there. Is enough that you decrease the tension to you know, to let the disc, you know, bulging slightly less, like a fraction millimeter to give a little bit of relief to the patient. So normally what happened that you treat the patient once a week for three weeks, in three weeks, the pain will start to decrease. Okay, it's not something that happened overnight, but uh, is enough to decrease a minor, you know, compression of the disc to generate a major result to the patient. It my really theory is that the disc doesn't bulge without reason. The disc bulge because the disc was setting up to hold on all your weight. But if the surrounding area, the surrounding fascia must become rigid, the disc has to hold much more weight and so start to protrude. The protrusion is not enough to have radiculopathy. My protrusion is a sign that there is too much tension nearby. So that is the first sign. As we know, that doesn't occur Overnight, it occur, you know, year to get it worse and worse. So before you will have a long history of lower pain, a long history of sciatic type pain due to myofascial pain. Then when the situation starts to become dramatic, the protrusion is so bad that it generates radiculopathy. So this means that you have a bunch of time, a huge amount of time to do prevention. And even when the situation is uh, dramatic with a real radiculopathy, with really weakness in the leg, Okay, something can be done in acute, decrease the tension, and of course, uh, there is a treatment plan that will require the weeks. But I mean, day by day, surge is now more aggressive like it was in the past, uh, and patients see that the conservative treatment are still a good option rather than surgery. And so we are seeing a big shift in the last five years. Does it change your assessment if they have like, an obvious uh, protection pattern, you know, if they come in shifted, they're intalgic, does that change your approach from fascial manipulation or, or you're just going to continue to do what you're going to no, do? No, because unfortunately that is not the way to make different diagnosis because uh, an antalgic position can be a huge myofascial pain. So the intensity of the pain doesn't tell me what is the origin. Uh, of course, if there is weakness, that is the sign. Okay. okay? Other than that, uh, okay, 
it is questionable, okay? So I know that if the pain starts from a low back area, it's almost sure it's not a radiculopathy or at the top of the radiculopathy, there is also myofascial pain. So sometimes uh, for the patient is the pain the problem, first of all, okay? The weakness, the decrease of the sensitivity is not a big deal. So if, if there is a myofascial pain plus radiculopathy, you take away myofascial pain, the pain is less than half, uh, patient is really happy. You decrease the tension uh, in a couple of weeks, the derniation can decrease by itself, but you will review the patient and the next week and the week after as well. If it's a poor decolopathy without anything else, okay, the patient is more manageable. It can lie down in some way, can lie down easily in the, in the table and you can treat properly. There are patients and not more than one, not one, more than one, that are decolopathy and they have just autonomic and motor component, not sensory. So they have lack of sensitivity and weakness, no pain at all. If they have a clear herniation, but they, they, they nobody have make diagnosis because uh, he didn't went to any specialist because the pain was basically zero. It's just weakness and uh, anesthesia in the leg. So we, we have to understand that the pain is a little bit more complex afferents uh, anesthesia and weakness is very clear, okay. Uh, herniation, uh, again, doesn't come alone. There is a process behind it. So, I mean, the history, the collection of the data of the patient will let you understand uh, how was the process and what is the range of improvement that you can do. Perfect. Yeah, I love it. So, uh, you, you know, Michael, you've met Michael Shackrock before, but you don't per se do neurodynamics in your everyday practice. Oh, uh, I mean, not, not really, but at the end of the day, we, I believe that we do the same. You're because working the range on the, yeah. of, end of range of motion and numbness, you know, we still use to figure out what is wrong. Okay. So we want to understand that the end of range of numbness, uh, Required so if you have nuns at the end of the range, required that the nerve is in a perfect shape. So if you you don't have a perfect shape of all the possible entrapment, end of the range numbness will uh, come in. Okay, so you wash the plate, you put the plate right there. Is there numb? You pick up the bag from the back of your car. You have numb. All the possible critical area of the of the entrapment of the nerve with the fascia has to be taken consideration. Okay, even the gliding between the superficial fascia and the nerve has to be taken in consideration because, uh, because you use at the best the possibility of the nerve to adjust, uh, to adapt to the, you know, uh, the surrounding area. So just to, I mean, we are doing, we are managing the same patient, okay? So from different approach, but the patient is that one, okay? It doesn't change to, to from one to the other. So the concept of the nerve, uh, the gladi of the nerve in his epinevrio is a critical concept. We know that there is a different level of the entrapment. We have to take consideration all of them when is, we have to assess the patient. Right. So fascial manipulation is addressing the container of the nerve versus neurodynamics is more like how the nerve is moving through the different tissues. So like, like we said, I mean, you're probably talking about the same thing, just approaching it from two uh, different ways. I mean, yeah. I mean... Between the nerve and the epinevrium, you have a loose quantity tissue. So even the viscosity of the loose quantity tissue will allow the nerve to glide properly in its in in environment. Okay? Right, right. So that is an important stuff. But even like a, how adaptable is the epinevrium to adjust to the tension of the nerve? Because the nerve is not extensible. So if you pull the nerve, the nerve starts to become straight. But the location of the nerve around the arm is not straight, okay? So the intramuscular septa will, you know, hold on the nerve in specific position. So the adaptability of intramuscular septa will permit the nerve to adjust in all the position that your arm is going to perform, okay? So it's difficult to isolate the nerve by the surrounding area, okay? I will rather prefer to think about it that the nerve is extremely influenced by the surrounding area. Okay, rather than, but I mean, is a composition of two elements that has to take into consideration. Sure. Which is honestly what the whole weekend's gonna be about, which I, is so exciting because 
Uh, we're going to talk about all aspects of it. We're going to talk about all the approaches. And I think at the end of the day, we're going to come to similar conclusions, which is going to be awesome. And so uh, I, I'm, I know I'm excited for it. It's been a, uh, something we've been looking forward to and kind of uh, uh, looking into it and try, trying to make it all work, basically. So uh, we're, we're excited to make it happen, right? Yeah, I think uh, having who we have there is really unique because you got Michael Leahy from Active Release. And they, I mean, as time's gone on, I mean, their approach, I mean, so much is about a uh, nerve entrapment within the muscles. Mm -hmm. And then we have Antonio talking about, you know, fascial, potential fascial entrapment with the nerves. We have Michael talking about neurodynamics. We have inflammation of the nerve root with David Seaman, uh, Annie O'Connor and her classification system, all the research from Jeffrey Bove. So it's going to be, it might be one of the more special weekends that have ever occurred as far as, you know, musculoskeletal rehabilitation. So I love it. Antonio, thank you for being here in Troy. Thank you for sitting down with us and educating us every time. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Well, well, you're going to be coming back for more. I know that's for sure. So, uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Uh, for more information, I'll link down below. Uh, we're, we're still waiting on the registration link, but hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have it all up there and uh, save the date. The first we weekend. We forgot Bill Morgan. Bill Morgan, obviously. Yeah, he'll yeah. be speaking. Uh, the fir first weekend in Mar or, uh, November, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Parker University in Dallas. So, make sure sure you book your flights and uh put that on your Parker's calendar. amazing i mean it'll be it'll be something special it'll be special yeah. so all right guys we'll have a great day and uh good luck with patience we'll talk i hope you enjoyed this episode of the gasalt education show uh if you liked it share it subscribe to it uh send it to your friends send it to someone that needs to hear this message uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the the best clinical advice that they can which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests so um, if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to us or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations let us know uh, for a list of our upcoming courses we're adding them all the dang time so go to gestaltedu.com click on courses and they'll all be right there for you all right have a good day